Okay. Hey guys, can you hear me all right? How's it going? Hey, what's up? All right, you can. Okay, you can hear me in the chat. Good, good, good. So glad. Okay. Oh my goodness. So for those of you who are just joining us, welcome to Apps Without Code Live. This is day two of this amazing four-day event that we're putting on for you guys. So I just want to kind of recap some things that happened yesterday and then talk about what's happening today. And then we're going to jump into a really awesome workshop on why your first app should be invisible. It'll be really interactive. So if you haven't already done this, I'm going to ask you guys to jump in the chat real quick and tell me your name and what city you're in. If you haven't already told me the reason why is so that I'm you guys can see me and you can hear me, but I can't see or hear you. I can only see you in the chat. So if you can tell me your name and what city you're in, I can know who I'm talking to, and it's less weird for me. Cool. All right. Hey, Paul's in Long Beach. Cool. Hey. Um, Tia's in Baltimore. Cool. Shara's in Portland. Hey, Shara. All right. Uh, oh, my gosh. You guys are going really fast. Um, Jonathan's in Dallas. Steve is in Chicago. Nita in Washington, D.C. Hey, guys. Oh, Chicago's in the house. Nice. Me, too. That's where I am right now. Awesome. Peter is in Barbados. Awesome. Blake's in San Francisco, San Francisco. And Santa Monica. Hey, Anne. Cool. Hey, guys. Center Anaheim, Yolanda's in Ohio. What's up? Cool. You guys are like driving in between places. I love it. Okay. So uh, as you guys are introducing yourself, and it's helpful, too, because people can see who's in the same city as them. You can kind of collaborate and meet up afterwards, all that good stuff. So um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, some people don't. So I'm just going to give you guys a quick intro. My name is Tara Reed. And I'm the CEO of Apps Without Code. I am a tech entrepreneur. I like to make apps, even though I am a marketer by trade. So I don't have a computer science degree. I would not call myself a tech genius. Um, but I found this really cool process of building apps without code that you know this whole organization, this whole conference has been built around. So I became an entrepreneur completely on accident. I remember there was a time where I swore I was never going to be an entrepreneur. The plan was to climb up the corporate ladder and have a regular nine to five job. And I thought those entrepreneur people were kind of crazy. I still do. Still think we're all kind of crazy. Uh, before launching my startup, I led marketing initiatives at Foursquare, Google, and Microsoft. And this process, this process we're going to talk about a lot today, actually, in this workshop of building apps without code got me a successful app, thousands of users, $150,000 in revenue, and over $300,000 from investors in just my first year of entrepreneurship. So now I take a lot of those things that I've learned, all the companies and mid-six-figure businesses that I've built, and I help other non-technical entrepreneurs and people like you um, piece all of this together, the business model, the marketing, the building the app, all of the strategy, how do you get the business off the ground, as you guys know, it's not just one thing, right? It's all of these moving pieces, and it is crazy. So this conference is four days, right, as you know. So day one was on bootstrapping and business model. I crossed that off the list because we have done that. If you did not get to see all of the workshops and all of the sessions from yesterday, the recordings are now all available. So after this session is over, you can go and take a look at the homepage of the conference and go back and watch any recordings from sessions that you may have missed. There were some really good ones. Can I hear from you guys in the chat what some of your favorite sessions were from yesterday or, you know, favorite thing that you learned from something yesterday? So I said finance. <laughs> Sabrina says a Yori session. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anyone else who had some favorites? Um, oh, yeah. Steven said the values and humility from Craig. Isn't he an awesome guy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Shara also said, Craig, uh, Mary said the business models 101 section. Steve said Aori too was dope. Yeah, Aori's way of structuring her go to market strategy was pretty genius. I am like writing notes and taking some, some things out of her book. Um, I said the ask me anything sessions. Yeah, where you got your specific questions answered about your own, uh, businesses. Absolutely. Uh, will the replays be available? Yeah, they will. They're already available from day one, and you can find them. If All you have to do is you go to 
the screen where all of the sessions are. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, the replays are showing up as they're available on the bottom. Cool. Um, awesome. Yeah, you have to see Craig's. Yeah. So that was day one. Like, as you can see, people loved a lot of different sessions from day one. So go back if you missed anything that was really important. Day two today is on non-technical CEO essentials, things that you need to know if you are building something and you are not necessarily a tech genius, what do you have to know? And it's going to be a really great primer for day three where we're talking specifically all about apps. We're going to start talking about apps and all that stuff today, but we're going to get more and more into it in day three. And then finally, day four, we're going to round it all out talking about marketing. And I've got some of the top tech marketing gurus coming to talk to you. And also on day three, just to go back, we've got the founders of a lot of really, really awesome tech companies. Some of them will be here today. Some of them will be here tomorrow. A lot of the technology tools you need to know and use for your own business, you get to meet some of the pioneers who are creating, teaching, and building, creating those software platforms. You get to be like, oh, yeah, I know the founder. So that'll be really awesome. Okay, so today is on non-technical CEO essentials. That's what we're talking about today. I want to point out a couple sessions that are happening today that you are really going to want to make sure you don't miss. So directly after this session, we may have a short break, but directly after this session, we're going into CEO war stories with Strikingly founder David Chen. If you guys are not familiar with Strikingly, it is a tool to build a really quick website for yourself and for your business. David is a non-technical entrepreneur. He doesn't write code himself. And so he's going to share his story of building a technical company as a non-technical founder. Really, really good. I'm so excited about that. The uh, other session that you should really keep an eye out for, how to build a social network without code. Um, that session is going to be coming up. And it's going to be a really, really good opportunity for you to, if you have social features that are going to be part of your app, you're really going to want to be part of this to see how you can create a social app for your uh, business. And then also, finally, uh, there's going to be a panel, Crazy Ways to Launch an App, going on today, where I'm going to have some entrepreneurs who have been in your exact shoes and have built apps without code, have built their businesses without code, just come share their stories. You know, what's really exciting about this panel is it's going to be people who are relatively close to where you are. They're one to two, maybe three years into entrepreneurship. And so they're going to really share all of that stuff about what it's like, you know, very early on building products without code, building technology and building a tech enabled business without code. Cool. So right now we are in the first session of the day, which is why your app should be invisible, which is like a crazy concept for a lot of people. So I'm going to break that down for all of you guys today in this workshop. And as I mentioned, we're going to be kind of talking. It's going to be interactive. So be prepared to type in the chat and talk to me because I want to be able to help you think through this concept of an invisible app and see if it's something that makes sense for you. Okay. So building invisible apps is a crazy new way to build an app. There are many ways to build apps without code. This is just one of them that we're going to focus in on today. So I want to show you before I even tell you and break down what an invisible app is, I want to show you an example first. And I'm going to use myself as the guinea pig. So this is a screenshot of the not so beautiful website that I built for my first company. And I built this website. I think I had the idea for my first company on a Monday. By Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, I had a website up. And it said, become an art collector, get a personal stylist for your walls. I found an image that I didn't even have you know, the rights to probably on Google and grabbed it off of Google and put it as a background image. I went and did a found a little like a Google logo generator and created a quick and dirty logo in like a couple minutes. I didn't, you know, spend so much time on it. I knew I was going to change it later. I wasn't stressed that much about it. I just smacked something on there. And then I sent an email to myself on my phone and I made the email look like I was an art advisor. And so you can't really read it. It says, Hey Gary, my name is Emily. I'm your new art advisor. Um, I took a look at your taste and I found some artwork for you here. Click the link. So I just sent that email to myself 
And then I took a screenshot of it and pasted it inside of a phone to make it look like a tech enabled experience. Now, mind you, I had no clue at this time. Remember, I'm only like three days into having an idea right now at this point. I had no clue how in the world I was going to be able to offer this service and this app idea that I had. I had no clue, but I wanted to put something up to first see if anyone was interested. I then allowed people to sign up. By using, you guys familiar with Typeform, typeform.com? Anyone familiar with Typeform? Throw in the chat and let me know if you are. So what I did was I created a Typeform for people to sign up. And I just asked them basic questions about their taste in artwork. Um, and because I was trying to gather the information I was going to need in order to help them find art, right? So I asked them about things that they liked. I asked them about their budget. I thought through kind of what are the questions I need to know in order to start servicing them. Again, I had no clue how I was going to make this happen yet, but I wanted to see if people would sign up. So what I ended up putting together was a string of different tools that I kind of strung all together. And all the tools were tools that were just publicly available to me on the Internet, either for free or for a cheap subscription. So I showed you that landing page where people could sign up. When they clicked the sign up button, it took them to a sign up survey. Again, this was not a survey asking them for feedback on anything or asking getting market research on anything. This was a survey. I used a survey to allow them to sign up for the service, right? Then all of their answers got populated into a spreadsheet. I used Google Spreadsheet for this. And I connected those two things together. I connected Typeform and sent all the information from Typeform to a spreadsheet. I used a software called Zapier to do that. Anyone familiar with Zapier? Throw in the chat if you're familiar with Zapier. And if you don't know some of these tools, I will break them down for you. Um, but I just want to kind of give you some clarity on how I did this for myself. And then I, so I zapped all the information from Typeform to a spreadsheet. And then I also set up another zap where whenever something someone was added to the spreadsheet, I sent them a new email that said, congratulations, here's your art recommendations, and it sent them a survey with art. So that artwork survey, again, this is not a survey asking people for feedback or doing market research. This was a, the first survey was allowing them to sign up. A second survey had a totally different purpose. So here's a little sneak peek at what the second survey looked like. It had a bunch of pieces of artwork loaded into it. Yeah, there's a couple other competitors that are really good too. WooForms is good. I used to use SurveyMonkey as well. Actually, you can actually see this was SurveyMonkey. Um, they've changed their pricing a little bit since then, so I, I don't use it as much. It's less uh, great for starting entrepreneurs. But I put a bunch of artwork in there, and then I made it a five-star rating question. Rate this piece. Do you like it or do you not? And then there was always a follow-up question that asked, well, why didn't you like it or why did you like it? And they're kind of multiple choice for reasons. So I was collecting all this information about people's taste, what they liked and what they didn't like. It also allowed people to save their progress and come back and finish rating their artwork recommendations later. And so many people messaged me and said, oh, my gosh, I love your app. This app is really awesome. And little did they know, all I had done was taken landing pages, some surveys, some spreadsheets, and Zapier kind of strung them all together. So that invisible app that I built made me my first $35,000 in sales and got us an investment from 500 Startups Accelerator, which we then went out to in San Francisco. So again, stringing things together, I think I spent my first few months of entrepreneurship, I spent less than $50 to $100 a month on all of those tools combined, including everything I was using for building the business, right? Um, and so there was, so um, that was the invisible app. A friend of mine, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Reed Hoffman has this really good quote. He says, if you're not embarrassed of the first version of your product, then you launched too late. I'm going to say that again so that it sinks in. If you are not embarrassed of the first version of your product, then you launched too late. So um, test your idea with an invisible app which has no programming skills required. And I want to talk to you guys about that today. That's what our session is on today. So what is an invisible app? Like, Tara, you're talking all about this invisible app. You're showing us an example, but like, what the heck is an invisible app in the first place? So an invisible app is an app that has no login. There's no logins. 
There's no passwords and no one downloads it. No logins, no passwords, no one downloads it. And instead, what you do is you deliver your service or you deliver your experience using things that your customer already has, like SMS or email. And then you can use things like landing pages, surveys, and other simple tools to create a technology-enabled experience for your customer, but there's no logins, there's no passwords, there's nothing to download. So I want to show you an example of another app that's been really successful doing this. Uh, this app is called, or this company is called Magic. Have you guys heard of Magic before? So uh, this is a, screen, a couple screenshots of Magic's website. Um, it says, upgrade your life with a 24-7 personal assistant. And what you can do is it says Magic responds 24-7 within um, seconds or minutes. Um, you and you, they respond to you, by the way, via text. So they give you a phone number and you can text them. Um, and it says magic will work on anything you give it as long as it's legal, right? So you can give it tasks to do, things you need help with, and it will help you with them. Uh, magic manages a team of trained assistants for you. So you're talking to real people and magic assistants are full time employees, et cetera. Over time, magic learns your preferences as well. So these are some examples of things that you can do with magic. Bring me a Spider-Man costume by 3 p.m. Or, oh, no, I'm at the airport and I lost, I left my passport at home. Can you go get it for me? Um, those are sorts of some personal tasks you can have it do. You can also have it do work tasks, right? Um, help me take care of my customer support. Or can you reply to every email in my inbox, et cetera? And Magic has raised over $12 million from some of the top VCs at a $40 million valuation. They really blew up. And literally, all it is is a phone number that you text. But it solves all of our problems, right? I really don't care. I actually prefer not to download another app. I can't tell you how many apps I download and delete later on. If I can just have something easy, it's just a phone number, and it solves all the problems I have anyway, I don't care if there's a fancy app or not. I just want my problem solved, right? And so Magic has done really well by keeping it simple, right? They've done a lot of automation in the background to streamline this, but they've kept it really simple, and they go to where the customer is, and the customer actually really appreciates it. Thanks for not making me download another dang app, right? So. Um, Invisible apps are, again, they have no logins, no passwords, no downloads. You take something that customers are already using and you deliver it to them with something they already have, right? So I want to uh, talk to you guys about imagining the product idea that you have in your head. Imagine that idea as an invisible app or service first, right? Imagine it as an invisible app. So people often pay more money for services and apps. We talked a little bit about this yesterday, right? Um, people think, unfortunately, that apps are free. Like they truly believe that apps are free, right? And so what you, or, or 99 cents. And so the way that you make money with your app idea, the true way that you can make money is by building a business that happens to have an app, not an app that happens to have a business. A lot of times, a really good way to do that is to position what you're building as a service, even though it's technology enabled. And this is a really great marketing strategy, even if you have the fanciest algorithm, the fanciest tech, it's often a really smart thing for you to do to position what you're doing. If you guys saw Aori's session yesterday, we talked a lot about positioning, to position what they're doing, what you're doing as a service. I'll give you an example. One of my favorite companies is called Pop Social. They've got a ton of technology in the background that manages engagement for your social media, for Instagram, for example. But their website doesn't say anything about the fancy tech because they know that people think tech is cheap. So instead, they say, let us be your affordable social media team. And you go, oh, yeah, hiring a social media manager, that would be expensive, but this is cheaper. This is a good value. Right. So it's a lot to do with positioning. And in a lot of ways, you know, pitching what you're doing as a service, even if it's just a marketing uh, tactic, 
does a lot for you because people perceive it to be more valuable. And it's why a lot of these concierge services or invisible apps do really well is because people perceive this to be actually of higher value. So to build an invisible app, you have to be very clear on the simple problem that you are solving. And before I jump in this, I'm going to answer just a couple questions in the chat and then we're going to go back to workshop and then I'll answer a couple more questions. So um, Tracy was saying, in my example, did you actually sell a product or did you just make art suggestions? So uh, after I made the art suggestions, I sold the art. Does that make sense? So after we made the art suggestions, somebody said, I want this one. And we brokered the entire deal for them and, and sent them the artwork. The artwork was not in our inventory. I'd never had a warehouse of artwork. All I did was I went on the Internet and found artwork that was publicly available. I told the person who was selling it, hey, I've got someone who wants to buy this now. Will you give it to me at a discount? Same way that like galleries do. And then I sold it to the customer for the same amount that they would buy it for online. And we made money by taking a margin off of it. Mark was saying, so essentially it's a halfway automation tool until you upgrade the full solution to automation. Yeah. Yes, it is, Mark. And you might find that your customers like it more when you keep it a balance of automation and not automation. Um, Ryan was saying Magic was built on their developed code and then updated the user face over time. Yeah, so there are really nicely, though, if you don't code, there are really great SMS tools that you can use. I'll show you one of them when we get later on into this workshop so that you don't have to do this with code. You yeah, guys, there are so many companies now that are building tools and software for people who don't know how to write code. And so you can create magic. We could, we sat down together. We could have it done by the end of the day um, if we wanted to recreate something like that. Um, Daphne was saying, this is where I'd like to know, how did they get to scale? This is uh, how they were able to get so many people to do their service. Yeah. So from a scale perspective, if you have virtual assistants, we could go right now on Upwork.com and find virtual assistants. We could hire 20 virtual assistants in 20 minutes to hire, you know, to handle all the back and forth chat. And if we give them a training manual and just say, do these things, then we can scale it as quickly as we want, right? So you can go find virtual assistants online for anything. But to start, you could do the work. You could be behind the scenes, behind the curtain. And then as you grow, you just get a larger team. Um... And then you can also automate it with technology, right? There are a lot of kind of um, AI solutions where you can have it, you know, if it has the word pizza in it, ask them the follow-up question. Are you trying to order a pizza, right? So you can automate it in different ways as you scale. Um, cool. Human is the engine in the middle delivering the service. Yeah, to start, it can be. Absolutely. Cool. All right, so we're going to talk about transitioning app ideas into invisible app or service ideas in a moment, so we'll come back to that. Um, but to build an invisible app, you must be very clear on the simple problem that you are solving. Specifically, there's kind of like a three-part plan that you need to do if you want to figure out, well, would an invisible app work for me? There's kind of three-part plan in order to do that. First, you've got to define the simple problem that you're solving. Many of you have not done this yet. You have not found the simple problem that you're solving. You found the like really complex problem that you're solving. And I'm going to kind of break down what I mean by that. Oh, Paul already has an idea. Yes. Paul, I'm going to ask you to share that in a little while because other people will get stuck on how they can, you know, make this work for themselves. So two is to define your three most important actions that someone needs to take in the app. This is really critical. If you don't know, your customers are not going to know. So you have to know this stuff so that you can convey it and build something that works for your customers. And number three, you can plan your invisible app from a list of options. I'm going to give you a list of software tools you can use to actually build your invisible app. So let's walk through all of these so that you can make it through this process. Cool. So a lot of times you guys make the problem you're solving really complex. So let me give you an example. A lot of times people say something like this. They go, well, the problem I'm solving is that today there's no way for people to aggregate the world's movies and get personalized recommendations based on their taste. Right. 
Like that is not, so that's like the way that many founders describe the problem that they're solving. And I bet if I would ask a lot of you guys, well, what's the problem you're solving? You would give me a very flowery answer that's kind of like that. It's totally normal. It happens, right? However, and by the way, that was Netflix, that example I just gave you. That's Netflix, right? That's how someone who's in their head as a founder might explain Netflix. However, no customer of Netflix would ever say this. Today, there's no way for people to aggregate the world's movies and personal. Like, they would just never say that. No, you have never said that as a consumer about Netflix in your life. Instead, the problem that you're solving here that Netflix is solving is that people are bored and cable is too expensive. It's really that simple. That is the simple problem. People are bored, cable's expensive. Done. Right? But a lot of times we make it too lofty and then it makes the work hard on ourselves to actually come up with a simple solution that we can make money from. Another way that people do this, the complex way, making it too difficult, is they'll say, you know, there's no easy way for business owners to forecast their revenue and run simultaneous scenario predictions of revenue at the end of the year. So I need to build an enterprise product that handles all of that, right? But there's no business customer who has ever used this flowery language and explained and kind of gone to their friend and complained and used those words. They just would never say that. That is founder speak. It's entrepreneur speak. It's not customer speak. Instead, your customers would say something like business owners are you know, I'm worried that I'm not going to hit my revenue goals. That's pretty much what they would say. It would be very simple. I'm worried I'm not going to hit my revenue goals. So what you want to do in order to get at your invisible app, the first step is to be really clear on the problem you're solving. So I want to take a moment. Can you guys throw in the chat the simple problem that you're solving? And if you need help, if you're stuck, what you should think about is what is the thing that my customers complain about on a regular basis to people? What are they actually saying in their words? So can someone take a stab at writing the problem that they're solving? It usually is really simple. They cannot close a sale. Yeah, really simple. Kids get lost during their academic journey. Parents don't know how to help. The counselors are too busy to give them what they need. Yeah, cool. That's like three separate problems for three different customers. But yeah, Mark, I would focus on one of those problems as your main target, by the way. Um, giving art teachers sub plans. That's a solution, Yolanda. What is the, are you saying that the problem is that they don't have sub plans? They don't have time to create the sub? Like, what is the problem that they have? Um, my author clients need book reviews and have trouble getting it beyond friends and family. Got it. And specifically, they're trying to sell the book. People don't know what their company is worth. Yeah. Art teachers spending hours prepping. Yep. People want spiritual help that works for them. Cool. I would even like fine tune that a little bit more. Right. What are they complaining about? Spe like, are they saying, oh, I don't have spiritual help that works for me? Like maybe they would use slightly different words. Right. Um, customers don't track their workout results. Cool. Paul, why does that impact them? Why does that impact the trainer or the coach that people don't do that? Um, Cool. Cool. Yeah. Michelle says no food delivery service. Um, give me more specifics, right, on that. Because the food delivery service is the solution. Like, what is it? Like, it's, you know, I don't have time to make dinner. Uh, give me something you know, more specific here. Uh, I'm not getting promoted in my company. Yeah, really simple. Just like clear. Um, I don't know how my child's performing at school. Really clear. Yep. Um, key points of problem solutions are hard to find. Uh, info online is too chaotic. Extra Zhao, can you zoom that in a little bit more? You're giving me too. If it's more than like a simple sentence, you're giving me too much and you're doing the founder thing. So I, I think you're on to something. Just zoom it in a little bit. Um, can't keep up with potential customers that come through Facebook messaging. Done. Opportunities to upsell. Um, like I don't have opportunities to upsell. I don't know where they are or I don't know how to convert someone in the upsell. Maybe there's something specific there, Paul. Um, can't come up with a meal prep plan. Okay, cool. Interest. Got it. Very clear. Helping the hardcore loyal music super fan experience connect 
Too many words. What's the thing that they're compa- complaining about? They need to sell records. They need more YouTube followers. Like very simple. Um, Max is saying current products cost way too much. What kind of products? Um, people want to do more for social causes, but don't know how to get started and are bored with annual soup kitchen like options. Sabrina, you're giving me a founder answer again. Like what's the thing that they're complaining about in their words? Someone would not say, I want to do more for social causes, but like it would just give me more like, what what's that kind of like the core of what it is that they're complaining about. Um People don't like carrying around bulk empty containers. Okay, I don't know much about um, what you're what you mean here. Not enough minority women physicians. Um, I would I would tailor that to what it is that your customer is saying. So like I want to support a minority woman physician, but I can't find one. Um, like get get a little bit clearer on that. Or I want a network of other ones that I'm a physician and I want a network of other physicians that I can connect with. I get clearer on on what you mean here, but that's good. Um, everyone has the idea. They cannot get meaningful connection to grow their idea. Um, Huey, give me a little bit more context here. You're a little vague. Um, I'm bored and I need something cool to do. Yeah. Friends flake out on plans after I've already bought tickets. Yeah. Cool. Um, (laughs) am I in the wrong job or company or is it me or them? Yeah. Eugene, that's really good. That's really good. That's like from the voice of your customer. Once you can do it as a quote of something your customer says, you're getting really close. Okay, so I'm going to pause on these um, so we can come back to them. Yeah, loyal fans need to support their favorite artists. Yeah, that's clear. And that's good if the loyal fans are your customers. If it's the other way around, then if your customers are the artists, I would just flip your sentence, right? Artists need to, like, you know, a way to gather support from their loyal fans so they can make money. Cool. Nita, not enough uh, minority women physicians due to lack of admissions. Complete. Okay, you're getting more complex. Who Who's complaining about this, Nita? Is it the physicians or, like, the schools or, like, who's uh, complaining here? Inclusion in the workplace sucks. Who's complaining about that and why is it a problem for them? Cool. Okay, I'm going to come back to this. So you want to get clear on the problem you're solving, and it needs to be the simple problem, not – the fancy problem. Joy, that's really good. Simple problem, not the fancy problem. If you have a fancy problem, you will get yourself stuck. It mainly will hurt you because you will be jumbled up in all the complexities. Cool. So that's step number one. Define the simple problem that you're solving. Get really clear on that. And those of you who are now getting clarity on that, Write it down somewhere, like put it on a sticky note on your computer, like actually write that down somewhere for yourself. Or if you're on Twitter, like tweet. Sometimes I tweet things so that I know and I can remember. And like I put this out in public, like put it somewhere for yourself. Don't care where it is. Just put it somewhere. All right. So number two, the second thing you need to do in order to figure out if an invisible app is going to work for you is to define the three most important actions someone needs to take in your app. So what do I mean by this? I'll give you an example, and then I'm going to have you guys give me examples for the rest of them. So Facebook. When we go look at Facebook online, like Facebook has a lot going on now. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. There's games, and there's pictures, and there's videos, and there's chat, and there's like all sorts of things happening on the Facebook feed. There's a lot going on in the Facebook feed. However, There are really only three core actions you need to be able to do in order for Facebook to be Facebook. Let me tell you what those are. And watch the way that I do this. I'm going to start with a verb, usually. um, And they're going to be, like, very, very clear things, right? I need to post updates, follow friends, and like posts from my friends. That's it. Like, if Facebook did not have all the rest of the stuff, it would still be, like, basically Facebook. Post updates follow friends, like posts from friends, right? All the rest of it is is, is extra. So uh, anyone familiar with, um, let's do YouTube, YouTube first. Someone throw in the chat and have a couple people try this. Tell me like the three important things, three core actions someone needs to be able to do in order for YouTube to work.
Search for video. Okay, that's a good one. Post videos. Post videos, upload videos are kind of the same thing. And watch videos. Search, watch videos. Yep, okay, you guys are going fast. Um, Play videos, post videos, share videos. Yeah, like really simple. Search videos, watch, upload. Yeah, yeah. Very simple, right? Very simple. There's kind of like three core things that you need to do, and the rest is the fluff, right? Uh, What about how many of you guys are are familiar with Upwork, Upwork Upwork.com? Who knows Upwork? You guys want to try this for Upwork? What are the three most important things you need to be able to do on Upwork? Post a job. Yeah. By the way, for those of you who don't know while they're doing this, Upwork is a um, website that allows you to find virtual assistance to help you with like any job or any work that you really need done. A lot of it is sort of like digital or online kind of work, but really anything you need help with. All right, so post a job. Yeah, I like this out. Post a job, make a deal, specifically like make an offer with someone that like, yeah, I'll pay you this in exchange for this and pay. Yeah, really simple. Post jobs, reply to posts, hire people. Yeah, post job, find somebody to help you pay them. Exactly, exactly. Like really simple, really simple. So we're not going to go through all of these examples, but what is most important is I want you guys to think about the most three most important actions someone needs to take in your experience, just like the three most important ones. So um, think about that for a second. I'm going to give you a second. Think about for your own idea, what are the three most important actions someone needs to take and type them into the chat. Keep it simple. I'll give you guys a second to do that. Think it through. Three most important actions for yourself. Okay. Find your artist. Daryl, that's one for you. If you do me a favor, put all three of them in one post so I can see them all together. Um, Linda saying, have a sales script. So, like, view the sales script. Um... Know their customer type, know their own sales style. Can you maybe change the verbs you're using, um, Linda, to be maybe something different, like view it, something else? Joy is saying post, view, rate. Cool. I don't know what they're – add something to that, Joy. Post something, add something. They usually are like two-word or two- or three-word phrases. Sign up, create a a profile, post listings. Lawrence, I'm going to let you try this one more time. You guys don't have to add the sign-up piece. Um, it's kind of an assumption, right? And so once once they have signed up, what are the three most important things? Uh, Zao, post a problem, match the person to provide key point solutions, make a deal. Cool, got it. Uh, select art, buy art, post about the art purchase. Got it, really clear. Uh, state the problem, analyze your opinion, take massive action. What do you mean by massive action? Are they going to take action in the app or are they going to re- going to report on their action. And what do you mean by analyze your option? Just maybe be a little bit clearer about what those are. Um, Connect with people like me, share tips, find products. Cool. Got it. Uh, Search options for social causes, agree to volunteer, invite friends. Got it. Cool. Pretty simple. Um, Find reviewers. Um, Email reviewers. And follow up to get reviews on Amazon. Got it. Okay. Choose restaurant, order food, pay. Yep. Can you give an example from yesterday's talk, Ayori? What do you mean by it? I'm not sure I understand the question about an example from yesterday's talk. Um, loyal fans find their favorite artists. Fans pay the artists. Fans experience the artists. Yeah, that's really good, Daryl. Just maybe uh, define what you mean by experience. But yeah, that's right. Input workout results, share with trainer, stay motivated. Yeah, absolutely. Paul, I once went to this gym where I used to work out there and they had like everything was tech enabled and I got to like put things into my, into the app. And I stayed at that gym until I moved out of the city for really only, the only other reason that I thought that the tech was cool, right? That was like their key differentiator. Um, so yeah, absolutely. 
Um, cool. Yeah, you guys, you guys are getting this, right? <laughs> yeah, I know we're going fast. There are going to be, there's going to be a recording. It may take uh, a couple hours to be available, but all of these sessions are going to get recorded and available for you. Cool. All right. Cool. Yeah, you guys are doing good on this. So get clear on your problem. The simple problem, right? Don't get too fancy with it. And then define your three most important actions. Once you've done that, you have the ammunition you need to figure out what you're going to do with your invisible app, right? Because at the end of the day, those are the things that people just need from you. They don't need all the extra stuff. The extra stuff can come later. You can add that on later. And you know how this works, right? All of the companies we know and love, Facebook, Google, they all just sort of will add features as they go. You don't have to have all of them baked perfectly at the beginning. So we're going to do one more activity here. Um, and the uh, activity is going to be, and this is going to be crazy for a lot of you guys, imagine for a second that apps don't exist. Just like imagine apps don't exist. I know it sounds crazy. And or specifically imagine that you can't create an app. So like it's not going to be an option for you to create an app for someone. And someone calls you, your phone rings and someone calls and says, I need help. You got to help me. I have insert problem here. And that problem is the same problem we defined from earlier, right? So if it's Netflix, hey, I need help. I'm really bored and cable is too expensive. Right. Whatever your problem was, you got to put in your own personal problem, plug it in. Right. So imagine they call you. You can't make an app to help them. Right. And they call you and they say, I have this problem. How would you manually help them? So this is what I want you guys to think through. And this is the big question that helps you create your invisible app. Someone calls. You can use tools on the Internet, but you can't build them an app. Right. You can use things that you have. You can use whatever other thing is at your disposal, but you can't build them an app. How would you help them if somebody calls you? That's the question. And I want to give you a list of tools that you probably are going to want to definitely consider, right? Um, and these are the tools that are most common in invisible apps. It is not, they're not the only tools, but they're the most common tools. So um, email, really simple. Right. Again, invisible apps are really simple, but they still deliver high value and get you lots of money for your customers. So email is the first one. Right. If someone called me and said, I need help because cable's too expensive and I want to find something cool to watch, I would go on YouTube or Vimeo and find some really cool indie movies for them and email them to them. They would be just as happy if they got an email with the videos as opposed to if they got a cool, fancy portal with all sorts of bells and whistles. They still have their problem solved, right? I could email it to them. Another thing I could do is I could text it to them, right? Maybe this is less uh, of, of a good fit for the Netflix example, but for some of you guys, you have people who are on, um, are on the go, right? They need something as they're going throughout their day. And so email maybe isn't the best way to deliver it to them. Maybe SMS text is, right? We looked at that example. So email, you can do by just setting up a free Gmail account for yourself, right? If you want to get fancy, you can uh, check out something called, let me show you, G Suite. You guys familiar with G Suite? How many of you guys know what G Suite is? Yeah. OK, so G Suite is Google's uh, email for companies. And the difference, only difference is that instead of a at Gmail dot com address, you get at your company dot com or whatever your domain is that you own. So let me show you. Um, and it's five dollars a month. And you get, you know, Google Docs and all sorts of stuff like that. I don't know if you guys can see my screen. Can you guys see? Oh, there it is. Um, this is G Suite. You get all this stuff. Um, and you just get an email for yourself. So that's a tool that you could use. And you can send your email communication to your clients. Right? That's an example. 
Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm trying to bring up my slides again for you guys. Hold on one second. So I'm going to finish this and then I'll share my screen and show you because it's hard to go back and forth. So email. Another one is SMS, text message, right? You can very easily text people, right? Um, and you can do that using a software tool called Sonar. Um, the website is sendsonar.com, right? Sendsonar.com. And sendsonar is like your control center for sending the text messages back and forth. All the messages come into one place, et cetera, right? Um, so sonar is a tool you can use. Landing page is also another tool, right? I showed you guys how I just had a landing page where people could sign up. But let's say that you were doing this Netflix example. What you could do if you wanted to get fancy was you could say, all right, you could send them an email or text and say, all right, I put together some recommendations of movies for you to watch. Click here to check them out. And you could give them a link to a landing page you created. On the landing page, you could embed three videos for them to watch right there on the page. And you could put a Netflix logo or whatever logo it is that you have on the top of it and say, you know, welcome to Netflix and have videos there for them to watch. You could even put, you know, a on landing pages, sometimes if you're using a more sophisticated kind of thing, or maybe even you could use a blog for this, right? Blogs allow you, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, you've ever seen a blog where it allows you to filter by like type of post. So it can, you know, you can filter sometimes it'll be like um, if it's a business blog, it'll be like filter to see the marketing post, filter to see the business post, filter to see the technology post, something like that. You guys seen that on a blog before? Throw, that, throw in the chat if you've seen that before, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you could do something like that and but just put different types of videos. And now people can search by genre, right? And so you've kind of hacked this together using your landing pages or your website blog kind of tools. Can you guys still hear me? I just want to make sure my audio is still on. Some people said they had trouble with audio. Can you guys still hear me? Cool. Okay, good, good. Okay. So um, another thing you can use is Google Sheets, right? Google Sheets are um, spreadsheets, but the nice thing about Google Sheets is they sit in the cloud on the internet and you can connect them to different software tools. So I mentioned an example, um, we talked about Typeform already, which you can allow people to collect responses and answer responses. So in the Netflix example, you could also uh, send somebody an email and say, I put together some recommendations for movies for you. And you can upload them. You can go to Typeform and create a Typeform. And the title of the Typeform is Movie Recommendations for John. And in the Typeform, you can have your first question. It can be like a five star rating question. And it can be put the video in there. You can put the movie that you found. And at the bottom, you can say, how did you like this movie? Rate it one star to five stars. And they can watch three different movies or short films and rate them, et cetera, in that Typeform. Right. And then you can take their answers because you want to save their answers and maybe use it to get better about giving them recommendations. You can take the answers and send them from Typeform to a spreadsheet to Google Sheets. Right. So now we're starting to get fancier, but it's still an invisible app. Your customer doesn't have to worry about logins, passwords, any of that stuff. And you can create it really quickly. Another thing you can do is use a tool called Zapier. Uh, and some of you guys said that you were familiar with Zapier. Their website is Zapier.com. Zapier allows you to connect different softwares together. It's pretty much the glue of your invisible app. It glues everything together, right? So you can set it so that when someone sends me a response email, send a text somewhere else. Or when someone answers the survey saying which um, tools that they, and which movie they liked, then put that into a spreadsheet. You can do anything. Then send them a calendar invite. Then do you can do all sorts of things. You can connect different software tools together. And Zapier has a database of a ton of different apps you can connect together. In fact, you guys will love this. Tomorrow, we're going to have the CEO of Zapier come talk to us. So Zapier is going to be like your glue the core tool you use if you're building an invisible app that's going to connect everything together and you get to meet the CEO of Zapier tomorrow. 
cool? Does that make sense? These are some tools that you can use for yourself. So how can you solve your customers' problems using invisible tools, right? Hacking something together and just creating a first version. I know this is not going to be the final version, but if you're like, I'm ready to go, I'm tired of sitting on this idea, and I just want to see if this is something that will work for people, you can just launch this. So Paul says, survey customers on five common workouts, run an algorithm, send the body diagram of strengths and weaknesses. Cool. And 80% of uh, one rep max goals. Yep. For 25 more exercises to them and their trainer. Yeah, exactly. And when you talk about running your algorithm, you know, I, I for my first company, we built an algorithm that matched people to artwork. When you talk about early versions of your algorithm, you can do that in a spreadsheet or you can do that by kind of figuring out, well, what are the criteria I'm going to use to match them to things, you know, based on their workouts, et cetera. The thing about algorithms is that they're created by humans, right? So you have to tell the algorithm generally how to work and what to do. And so this time where you have your invisible app running, if you have you know plans for building an algorithm, this time that you're creating your invisible app, you're getting all the information you need to figure out, well, how is the algorithm going to work? So you may manually do the algorithm at first and then start to automate it you know, through spreadsheets, et cetera. So right now it's in Excel. Exactly. Perfect. Paul, that's fine. That's great. Right? That's totally great. Everyone's algorithm starts in Excel at some point. Cool. So is anyone, let me see what we have coming up here. Um, we're going to have, we have a couple more minutes here, and we do have an AMA later on today. So you will have an opportunity if you're really stuck and you're like, I kind of get this invisible app concept, but I don't get how this works for me. Um, you can um, ask your question here. I'll take some questions here, but if you, some questions now, but if you don't get a chance, I just want you to know that there is another AMA coming up today if you're kind of stuck on this. But is anyone completely unclear on how they could solve that problem for their customers using some invisible tools? Um, you can type in the chat any questions that you have, and I'm happy to answer. So Daphne said, why were you transferring your type form to Google Sheets? So I was just taking their answers and saving them in a database where I could later match them to artwork based on their taste. So um I wish I still had this. I used to have this really fancy spreadsheet that kind of connected people based on their answers to different pieces of artwork I had in the database. And when I say database, I mean the spreadsheet. So um, I was sending them over so that I had it in a spreadsheet format somewhere. That's all. Where it was easy for me to view everyone's answers. and I didn't have to log into the type form every single time. Um, Daphne, uh, Lisa said, I use Google Forms to transfer to Google Spreadsheets, too. Yeah. What are the differences between an invisible app and an MVP? Yeah, great question. So in an MVP is, is, is a term that we use in tech. It's called a minimum viable product. It is the minimum kind of work you need to do in order to get a first product out. So an MVP is really just a term. You're in, you could very easily say, here's my invisible app. It's my MVP, right? It's the minimum viable thing I needed to do to test the product, right? A lot of times, though, and the reason I don't like personally the word MVP is because we have lost the meaning of the M in the MVP, the minimum. So a lot of times you talk to people and they're like, I've been working on my MVP for two years. And you're like, wait, there's something wrong here. I thought the MVP was supposed to be minimum, right? So I think that uh, you're, there's no difference between your invisible app and an MVP. You could choose to create an invisible app for your MVP. You could code an app for your MVP. But your MVP is supposed to be kind of the first version and the first simple thing, right? And I think the problem with the term MVP is that people have started to believe that you need to make it very fancy. Right. And it doesn't necessarily need to be fancy. So an invisible app doesn't necessarily equal an MVP, um, but it is a way to do your MVP. Oh, thank you, Brian, for reminding me I have questions in the Q&A section. Let me go look over here. All right. Uh, Brian says, if there are no logins or passwords for an invisible app, does a customer update their information in your customer database, i.e., 
uh, they've got a new credit card number, they've changed their phone number, they've moved their address. Obviously, you could email and call, um, and you could manually update that information in your system, but clearly this isn't scalable. Is there an automated way of doing this without logins for your customers? So um, the, the short answer is yes, there is. Here's the easy way to do this. Um, you can do that using Zapier. So what Zapier will do, let's say someone fills out a form and they need to update their phone number, just making up a scenario, right? So, or they need to update their taste or their profile or whatever it might be. You can have Zapier do one of two things. I'm not going to go all the way into like a Zapier tutorial now. Um, I don't know if we're going to have uh, more kind of tutorials of Zapier later on in this conference. I'm not sure. Um, but you, it's a very easy and simple tool for you to check out. But what you can do is one of two things. You can set Zapier. One option is that when someone fills out the form, add a new row to the spreadsheet. Right. That's the simple way. However, if someone makes an update, now you have and Brian, let's say Brian fills out the form and Brian makes an update. We've got two rows for Brian. Right. We don't need two rows for Brian. We were really just trying to update Brian. So another thing you can do. So that's one way you can set up Zapier just to add a row in the spreadsheet when someone fills it out. Another way you could do that, though, is you can search the spreadsheet. And if they're already in the spreadsheet, just update their row. And Zapier will also allow you to do that. So that is an automated way of doing it. But I also want to comment on Brian's point about, you know, scalability. This is a very, very common piece of advice in startups. When you launch, you should build something. It's okay to build something that doesn't scale. All you need to do is build something that solves your customers' problems, and then you can start figuring out how to scale it afterwards. You don't have to build a scalable solution to start. That is not important. In fact, it'll probably trip you up, right? You, you should later on figure out how scalability works. But in day one, week one, even like your first six months to a year, you don't need to be as focused on scalability. It's kind of one of those myths about building a product. But just to answer your question directly, Brian, that is a way you can do it. I have found in my own journey building apps without code that I would always come up to these roadblocks where I would go, mm, I feel like this isn't possible without code anymore. I feel like maybe I have to you know, transition and I would find I would I would use this kind of hacker mentality to get creative and I would find a way. So I continue to build apps without code and have found solutions to almost everything. And the things I can't find solutions to, I t here's what I do. I take a step back and I go, well, is this thing I'm trying to accomplish? Let's say I'm trying to accomplish a automated back and forth chat feature. And I go, is this thing I'm trying to accomplish part of the three top three most important functionalities my customer needs? If not, then I'm not going to worry about it right now because it's not in the top three. It's just extra. Right. So make sure you don't get caught up in the extra. Uh, Jasmine said Zoho is a free alternative to G Suite. Um, I know that security and privacy are, are um, important issues when choosing tools that work for you. How much is cost a factor? So when I started out, cost was a huge factor, and we still think about costs, right? We have, you know, some people who are on my team are in this chat. We still think about, like, do we want to use this software? It's kind of expensive. Does it fit into the budget? So it's always a factor. Um, for me starting out, it definitely was a factor. But what you will find is that you're going to have to put a little bit of money in in order to get some out. So there will be some tools you have to pay a little bit for. Uh, Pamela said, I found Zapier to be very complex to work. Um, it depends on what you're trying to create. i um, happy to maybe kind of answer any questions specifically you have. But the great thing about Zapier, and this is true and just a great pro tip for all of you guys, is you should ask the support team. Like, they all have teams of people who are sitting there waiting to help you. Email them. Send them a screenshot of what you can't work out, and they will help you. They're really good at that. Okay, so um, we are running out of time. So if you didn't get your question answered, hold on to it and bring it to the Q&A, okay? Hold on to it and bring it to the Q&A. It can be a question about anything. All right, we are going to wrap up. The next session is going to be starting soon, and I will talk to you guys very shortly.